Right, well, welcome to my first Gresham College lecture of 2014, and a particularly warm welcome to anyone who is at Gresham College for the first time. Um, and I hope that, if that is the case, you will come back many times and take advantage of the wonderfully varied lectures that Gresham College offers. This is the first of three lectures I'm giving this term. <coughs> the next two are about topics in mathematics and computing, which I find particularly fascinating. On the 17th of February, I'm talking about matching algorithms, which are the ways in which we can pair off couples in computer dating, for example, or assign people to jobs in a way which takes into account everybody's preferences. And I'll be discussing some of the surprising insights that emerge. We'll find out, for example, that if you're organising a tennis tournament, it's much easier to arrange the pairings in ladies and men's doubles than in the mixed doubles. Then, on the 17th of March, I shall be talking about the use of randomness in mathematical computing. You might think that mathematics is a subject of logic and rigour and has no room for tossing coins in mathematical decision-making, but it turns out that randomness is a valuable component in solving many totally non-random problems. And neither of these lectures will assume any particular mathematical knowledge on the part of the audience. But today's talk has a different focus. <coughs> Sorry. I'm going to explore human error, especially the mistakes we make when we use computers, and the difficulties that interaction designers face in creating systems that we can use effectively and comfortably. Computers have given us power I never dreamt of in my youth. We carry around with us more computing power in our phones than was available from the most powerful computers in the world only a few decades ago. Computers and cameras, cars, sat-navs, and so on, do much to make our life easier. The laptop beside me and the data projector above you, not to mention the information content of the internet, and the power of search engines allow me to illustrate these talks in a way that was not available to speakers at Gresham College for the first four centuries of its history. And indeed, at this moment, you may be listening to me long after I physically delivered this talk here in Gresham College through your computer or phone or tablet through the invaluable Gresham College app. So computers give us huge power. Yet it often seems that, more so than with other technologies, they bring with them immense frustration as well. We have all struggled to negotiate computerised ticket machines, set, a wake, set up a wake-up alarm on our mobile phone, or to navigate a confusing website. As I was preparing this talk, I opened up the software Adobe Acrobat when I intended to open up Adobe Photoshop, so I cursed closed it down, and then opened up exactly the same software again. Many of us have failed to save the final version of an important document, or have deleted the wrong file. I regularly send emails to colleagues without the attachment, which is the sole purpose of the email, and I'm far from alone in this habit. Thanks to the wonders of autocomplete, I have on many occasions sent emails to the wrong person, and thanks to predictive text on my antique mobile phone, um, some of my text messages have baffled the recipient. I may be a mathematician, but I don't think that's a good enough, enough reason for my phone to change beer to ads in that text that I sent recently. Such problems generally do no more harm than cause frustration and minor inconvenience. But occasionally, the consequences of an error with new technology can be more serious. According to recent press reports, Larry Barnett of Arkansas wished to resolve a dispute with his business partner by hiring a hitman to kill him. He was talking face to face with the contract killer about this project when he happened to change his position and inadvertently pressed a button on the mobile phone in his pocket, causing it to dial his intended victim, who as a result 
was able to hear the whole conversation about the assassination and take appropriate action. And Mr. Barnett is now facing a charge of conspiracy to commit capital murder. Well, I've never made that particular mistake or been in that particular situation, or at least I'm not going to admit it if I have. But I have made some very annoying errors with simple computer systems. For example, one of my tasks as a university lecturer is to provide references for graduates. And a dozen or so times every year, I have to go through one particular electronic system to write references for students who are applying for teacher training courses. I therefore know this system reasonably well because I've used it many times a year for several years. Yet this is what happened recently. On this occasion, I'd been away and I knew that the reference was fairly urgent um, because the, um, the university was waiting for the application. So I was keen to complete the reference quickly. So I typed my name and password into the system and came, came up with this screen, which um, you can possibly just about see, um, which asks for confirmation that I'm the right person. There are three tick boxes. I can confirm that I'm Mr. Tony Mann, I am willing to provide a reference for the student in question, and I have read the help text at some length. <coughs> so I tick these boxes and progress to a second screen, which shows my personal details for, for me to check, and asks me to tick two more tick boxes. I confirm that the details above are correct, and I no longer wish to provide an online reference. And you can see what happened. I'm impatient. These are simple tick, box, tick boxes, all of them asking me to confirm things apart from the last one. So I tick them all, um, click save to proceed, and suddenly I find I've done the wrong thing. I've said I'm no longer willing to provide the reference, and this is only seconds after on the previous screen I said, yes, I am willing to provide the reference, so <laughs> whatever. Um, and the system takes at me at my word and now denies me access, and I have no way back. And I can't believe I've been so stupid. You know, how could I make such a mistake as to tick a box saying exactly the opposite of what I intended? So what do I do? Well, I phone the organisation immediately, very apologetically, and the person I talk to is very sympathetic. It turns out she gets these phone calls all the time. <laughs> People make this mistake regularly. It's very natural when you're confronted, confronted with five routine tick boxes when the first four must be ticked to continue, just to tick them all, even if you've been through a system relatively often. Um, we know we're ready to proceed, and we assume all tick boxes are confirming it. And when it turns out there is a well-established procedure for recovering from this error, I have to consult, co contact the student and ask him to resubmit my details, which takes some time, but it can be done. So this is a common blunder. The design of the screens leads people into it regularly. It causes delay for the applicant and for the institution. It causes inconvenience for the referee. It causes extra work for the administrators who have to take all the phone calls. And yet, after several years, at least the last time I looked at this system, uh, nobody had bothered to change the screen. So this mistake is still being made, causing frustration and unnecessary work, delaying applications, and generally irritating a great many people. But it's not just with computer systems that we blunder. Most of us make all sorts of mis mistakes frequently. We might try to open a security door with our Oyster travel card instead of the correct key card. We panic when our Oyster card isn't in the correct pocket because we took it out 20 seconds earlier and it's in our other hand. We make sandwiches for lunch and then leave them on the kitchen table instead of putting them in the bag. And we make chilli and forget to put in the chilli powder. And that's only some of the mistakes I've personally made in the last week. <laughs> um, sometimes we have difficulties operating simple devices like doors. Here's what happened at the end of my lecture last week. You will see we have the doors of the lecture room with a bar which... <laughs> yes. Yes. 
my thanks to my students, Reese and Annika, for their assistance with that. Um, and that is a real problem I've had on more than one, one occasion with that door. But doors are commonplace, and they're uncomplicated. They don't offer many choices. You can push, or you can pull. So why did this one cause trouble? Well, it's because it gives the wrong visual cue. Um, the gas bubble handle that you can possibly just about make out in that rather dull slide um, invites you to pull it. If it was a flat plate, like the one in the door there, you would have to push it. And these clues are so suggestive that it is baffling if the action they lead you to take instinctively doesn't actually work. Logically, if pulling the handle doesn't open the door, one might expect somebody to try pushing instead. But actually, my response more often is a feeling of panic. I'm trapped. I can't get out. And as well as the panic, I feel incompetent and very embarrassed. And here I am with you know, more than half a century's experience of opening doors, and I can't work this one. What's going wrong? And this embarrassment is typical. We blame ourselves when we cannot work something. In the case of this door, arguably, the fault lies with the designer. A bad design presents users with the wrong visual cues. Sorry. <coughs> we make the deduction that the design encourages and then we blame ourselves for getting it wrong, when actually the deduction was a sensible one given the visual appearance of the door. And the designer really should take responsibility. But as we will see, our tendency to blame ourselves in these situations is actually unhelpful for everybody. As a brief aside, doors present wonderful examples of good and bad interaction design. The designer only has to show discreetly, whether to push or pull, and perhaps, if the door is too symmetric, whether it hinges to the left or to the right. This is the starting point for Donald Norman's wonderful and influential book, The Design of Everyday Things, which I strongly recommend as a hugely entertaining and insightful introduction to interaction design. Here are some examples. The door which we see here actually has a plaque on it saying push. But the strong visual cue from the bars leads us to ignore or completely miss the written instruction. The bars on the doors in my next example, um, you probably won't be able to see this and that's telling, um, the bars are actually engraved with letters for pull and push on either side, but you almost can't see them not only in the slide, but in real life, and therefore it doesn't really do a great deal of good. Arguably, if a door carries written instructions, that is an indication of design failure, because the door shouldn't lead them. It should be obvious how to open it. And it's a double design failure in the case where the word, which is necessary because the door is, the visual look of the door leads us astray, is still too discreet to counteract the immediately misleading appearance of the door. The next example shows another door with a pull bar to the right. Clearly, people had trouble opening this door from the other side, so the word push has been placed prominently on the glass on the other side. However, many of us read this word through the glass. We don't really notice that the lettering is reversed, and we try to push from the inside. And I once, late at night, had to make a five-minute detour because I couldn't get through this door, which I used regularly, and because I was pushing rather than pulling. And I was not the only person to make that mistake. It was quite entertaining watching people. But the right visual cue can make it easy. This final door picture, I'm sorry, it's a little bit dark, shows a pair of doors where no one is going to get it wrong because one of them has a bar for pulling and the other is a flat plate for pushing. And the cues are so clear, and that's the operation required, so there should be no problems. The doors show us that when we interact with the world, 
we take information from many different sources, not just the most obvious. A tragic example of this was in the terrible Kegworth air crash of 25 years ago, in which 47 people were killed. Here, a British Midland Boeing 737 suffered failure of one of its two engines. This should not have been disastrous because a single working engine was enough to land the plane safely. The pilot shut off the right-hand engine, but in fact, it was the left-hand one which was malfunctioning. And with its one good engine switched off, the plane lost power and crashed into the ground. So why did the pilot shut down the wrong engine? There was a bang, vibration, and smoke entered the cabin. The instruments showed it was the left engine that was giving trouble, correctly, but it seems the pilot ignored these instruments, which were small, hard to read while the plane was vibrating, and had recently been redesigned without any training for the pilots. But the pilot knew that the air conditioning intake for the cabin was to the right of the plane. So if smoke was in the cabin, the fire had to be in the right-hand engine. What the pilot didn't know was that this was the very newest model of 737, and unlike all the previous models, it had air intakes on both sides. So one of the factors in the crash was that the pilot was making quick but incorrect deductions from information other than the instruments and giving considerable weight to these. We use whatever information we think is relevant, not just what the designer intends us to use. And this is very difficult for designers to foresee. Another difficulty for designers is imagining what might go wrong. As human beings, we make mistakes. Usually, the consequences are minor. And this is in part because designers are well aware of this human propensity and build systems that are robust and resilient. They make it more difficult for us to make mistakes and they build in checks to ensure that when we do err, the outcome is not too serious. The history of railway safety technology, for example, is largely the story of continuous improvement of systems as we learned from accidents what might go wrong and as engineers worked imaginatively to make errors impossible or to minimise the consequences if they should occur. And the difficulty of this task is shown by the accident at Hull Paragon Station on 14 February 1927 when two trains met head on following an unfortunate combination of mistakes. One signalman, intending to move point lever number 96 to set the points for the incoming train, instead moved the adjacent lever 95, which diverted the outgoing train into the path of the other. This should have been impossible, because the advanced safety features prevented the points from being moved unless the route was clear. But unfortunately, the other signalman had cleared the signal controlling the incoming train a little bit early, before it had completely passed the signal. He had miscounted the coaches and thought they'd all passed when there was one more to come. There was a window of 1.9 seconds provided by the early clearance of the signal, and it took 1.6 seconds to move the points. You can see how unlucky it was that the wrong lever was moved precisely at the only time when it could have adverse consequences. So all the precautions against human error were subverted by a combination of two mistakes and some very bad <coughs> sorry, and some very bad luck. But systems for railway signalling are obviously safety critical, so it is natural that designers should be very well aware of the dangers of error. But sometimes systems in which safety does not appear to be an obvious factor can present the possibility of disastrous error. Some years ago, a colleague of mine told me about an incident in which his wife had played a part. She was a pharmacist, and someone came to her pharmacy with a prescription which included two drugs which the pharmacist knew would be fatal if taken together. We'll call them A and B for the discussion. Um, she immediately phoned the doctor who had issued the prescription, and his rather annoyed response was that he was well aware that these drugs must not be prescribed together, and he would certainly never have done so. 
but the prescription did show that. So what had happened? Well, the doctor was printing the prescription from a computer system which presented a list of available drugs on a drop-down menu. So he saw things, something like this. Um, I've invented the name of um, a drug in question. This, um, the doctor was trying to prescribe drug C for his patient, which I've called alpha, beta, gamma, etc. Um, and it happened to have a name which is 24 characters long. The text box in the computer system displaying the name of the drug only displayed 24 characters. As it happened, there were two versions of this drug available. There was drug C itself, and there was drug C combined with drug A. And the first 24 characters of these are actually identical. So the doctor, choosing one of these from the menu, um, and not noticing there were two, um, had chosen the wrong one, and had prescribed C with A, rather on straight C. And since he was also prescribing drug B, the result was that he had written a prescription for two pills, which in combination would have killed the patient. Unfortunately, the pharmacist was alert enough to avoid the danger. But what is interesting about this error is that it is essentially due to a decision taken by a database designer who could hardly have foreseen the situation. A decision about the capacity of a text box in a database doesn't seem to have any serious safety implications. And yet the consequences of this decision could, in this case, have been disastrous. So this shows just how difficult the interaction designer's task can be. So we see that user errors can be dangerous as well as frustrating. The task of those who design interaction is to help the user interact with the system as successfully as possible. How can they do this? We interact best with a system when we have a helpful mental model of how that system works. As human beings, we have evolved to make sense of the world. Our brains take in impressions from our senses and build an understanding, a mental model, of what is going on. We then use the models our brain has constructed to determine our behavior. If my model of my next door neighbor is that they are someone who gets angry about trivial things, I won't park my car in their parking space. If my model is that they're easygoing, then I might be tempted to do so. I depend on the accuracy of my mental model to negotiate the world successfully. Thanks to evolution, we have excellent intuitive understanding. <coughs> we have excellent intuitive understanding of the behavior of the physical world. We have evolved to make sense of the world around us, and we have generally good intuition about interacting with physical objects, except possibly for some doors. Um, and the importance of this intuition is easy to demonstrate by considering how it can be exploited. A great many of the amazing effects achieved by mathematicians, sorry, achieved by magicians, um, Forty and slip there. Um, a great many of the baffling effects achieved by magicians result from our forming the wrong mental model of the situation. So, for example, I have three ropes here. I'm holding them up, and they are obviously three different lengths. And I'm happy for people to inspect these afterwards. All I'm going to do is gather them up so that they are all the ends are at the top, and say the magic word, abracadabra, and all three ropes are now the same length. So what's going on here? <laughs> right. Well, <coughs> most audiences will assume that these are special ropes. But in fact, something else is going on, and if you were impressed by the trick, then it's because you formed the wrong mental model of what you're observing. If you don't want to know how this trick works, please look away now, and I'll tell you when to look back. Um, so this shows what you're seeing. You're seeing my hand in front of the ropes. This is what you deduce is happening from the other side. What is really happening, however, 
is this. Okay, you can look back now if you've been looking away. Um, but what this shows is that these mental models are really powerful. And if you think it through logically, in something like that, like that has to be going on. But it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to discard the mental model we have formed. We don't discard these mental models at the first sign of trouble. Instead, we try to find an explanation consistent with these mental models, unlike the that may be. That's why we find magic tricks so baffling. It comes more easily to us to think that something supernatural is going on than to question the mental models we have been led to form. The expertise of a magician is not so much in sleight of hand as needing us to form the wrong model of the situation we're observing. <coughs> and we see the same phenomenon with optical illusions. Presented with an ambiguous image, the brain tries to make sense of it. It forms a model. This one is a duck. The one at the bottom left is an old woman. To the bottom right, we have a vase. At the top, we have a cube whose front surface is to the top right of the screen. After we look at these for some time, the contradictory information um, forces itself to our attention. We realize our model isn't quite working, and we try to find another model which might work. This is now a rabbit. The bottom one is now a young woman. We have two faces. The cube is oriented with the front face to the bottom left. And we can switch between these, but we cannot generally see both versions at the same time. We form a mental model, and that mental model is what the brain works with, not the actual image that is present, that is present on the retina. So when we use physical objects, we deduce how to use them from the mental model we form based largely on their immediate appearance. Since computer software doesn't display its physical construction, it's much harder to see how we should work it. The job of the interaction designer is to lead us to build a helpful mental model of how the system works. This is, in a sense, the exact opposite of what a magician does. The magician wants to lead us to form an incorrect mental model that will cause us to misinterpret what we are seeing. The interaction designer wants to lead us to form a mental model which will ensure that we navigate the system effectively. But when the mental model conflicts with the behaviour of the system, we have trouble. That's what causes so much of the frustration we all experience when using computer systems which don't match our mental models. For example, when I use web-based systems, I make frequent use of the back button at the top of my browser. There's one system that I have to use occasionally, which, as well as the back button, provides links labelled back on every page. But although these links appear to take me back to the previous page, they don't function in exactly the same way as the back button. What they actually do is open a new copy of the page. That may seem innocuous, but it means that if you're keeping track of the navigation in your head, you're not where your mental map says you are. And although I understand this distinction in principle, when I use the system extensively, um, I can find it quite literally maddening. The navigation is baffling because the back button doesn't take me back. And this mismatch between what I think is happening and what the computer actually does is, for me, physically painful. On one occasion, it actually made me want to bash my head against the nearest wall. And that, you know, what is really a very slightly awkward quirk in a very straightforward and extremely useful computer system can have such a strong effect on an experienced user shows just how much is at stake in the design of interaction. So the designer's task is to suggest the right mental model. Perhaps counterintuitively, this model doesn't have to be an accurate representation of what is really going on. When I'm editing a document on my computer, I think of it as a continuous sequence of pages. 
In the computer's memory, the file will be split, will be split into scattered fragments, which are all over the memory of the computer, and which are tracked and collated by the computer's operating system. But I don't need to know that. My model, based on my familiarity with existing technology, is sufficient to help me do what I wish to do, whereas thinking in detail about how the bytes are actually being manipulated by our software um, at the lowest level would be extremely unhelpful. The designer's task is much more difficult than helping me understand the low-level details of the functioning of the system. So an effective strategy is for a system to present its unfamiliar workings in terms we already understand. So that's why one operating system refers to Windows, desktop, files, and things like that. The match doesn't have to be perfect for the strategy to be effective. We understand that a window on a computer screen gives us a view of um, something we're working with, and that another window lets us see something else. We bring... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. We bring to the computer our understanding of some of the features of real windows, desktops and files. The fact that, unlike windows on my computer screen, the windows of my house cannot be resized whenever I wish doesn't stop me using the analogy to work effectively on my laptop. But there's another very strong reason why interaction design is difficult. The problem is that the designer, who knows very well how the system works, has to put themselves in the place of the user who doesn't. And that is very difficult. To build the system, the designer has to think like a computer. To make it easy to use, they have to think like a human. And these are very different modes of thinking. And trying to use both perspectives simultaneously is rather like trying to see both readings of one of the visual illusions at the same time. In my experience, many of the best systems programmers eventually go native. They find it very hard to communicate with their users because they can only see the system from the computer's viewpoint and they cannot easily switch to see it the user's way. So to appreciate the user's point of view of a system is an inherently difficult thing. When you have designed a system and someone presses the wrong button, one's natural reaction is to say, what a stupid user, not, I didn't design that very well. When you face a sign saying push on a door, it is hard to imagine that an intelligent user might still pull. It's very, very annoying when you put a lot of thought into making something easy to use, only to find that the users don't find it easy to use. The temptation is to regard the user as an unthinking idiot who doesn't have the intelligence to appreciate the finer points of your design. And that's an absolutely overwhelming temptation. But fortunately, good designers are able to reject this gut reaction and can come to understand the reasons for the user's difficulties. And this is where designers are not always helped by users. When we make a mistake, we blame ourselves. When I can't open the door because I push instead of pulling, that's my fault. So I don't complain. I don't tell a designer they've got it wrong. And since many people are like me and don't report these mistakes, the designer gets no feedback and never realises that their design is causing problems. The design guru, sorry, the design guru Donald Norman, tells of an occasion when he was asked to advise about the usability of a computer system that was under development. This system made different uses of the enter and return keys, which, a distinction which, for good reason, has largely vanished from computer keyboards now. Use of the wrong key might cause the user to lose unsaved work. Even though this, this was made clear in the system instructions, Norman thought this was asking for trouble. People used to using these keys interchangeably. However aware they were of the instructions for the system, would be likely to hit the wrong key from time to time. So Norman asked the designer if this wasn't happening, and the designer said, no, it wasn't. He was talking to the users, and nobody had ever 
had this happen to them. Clearly, there was no problem. But when Norman spoke to the users, every one of them said that they had lost work in this way many times, and that it was very frustrating. So Norman asked why they hadn't reported it when they had been asked to give feedback. And the answer was always along the lines of, it's a stupid error I've made, the instructions are absolutely clear, it's entirely my fault, I got it wrong, the designer doesn't want to know about my mistakes, he only wants to know what's wrong with his system. So our instinct to blame ourselves means designers don't get the feedback that would help them improve their systems, even when they specifically ask for it. So good design can help us make fewer errors, but we can also help ourselves. Where we have a tendency, where we have a tendency to make particular errors, we can take precautions. These may be as simple as making it a habit whenever I get up from my seat at the end of a train journey to look around to make sure I haven't left a scarf, book or phone on the seat or a bag on the luggage rack. And we can call these little tricks resilient strategies. Strategies for avoiding and overcoming errors. I'm sure we all have them, and I shall invite you to share yours at the end of this talk. Another example deals with flash drives, these helpful USB devices which we use to transfer files from one computer to another and invariably end up leaving in the machine at the end. Um, what can we do about that? Well, some people avoid this problem by attaching a flash drive to their key ring. We are much less likely to leave that big key ring dangling from a computer than a tiny flash card. The danger, of course, is if we do leave it, then we find when we get home we don't have our house keys and we've traded the minor inconvenience of a lost flash drive for the rather more major crisis of being locked out of our house and car. My personal preference is to make it an absolute, absolutely rigorous policy to remove the flash drive from the computer as soon as I've copied the file and put it in my pocket and never leave it um, for the whole of my talk. So last week, when I made my sandwiches and left them on the kitchen table, what strategy might have helped me avoid that mistake? Well, the sandwiches left my mind while I was washing the dishes. So a good strategy might have been to put my sandwiches, my sandwiches in my briefcase as soon as, I'd made, as soon as I'd made them before doing the washing up. The risk is that in so doing, I forget about the dirty dishes. But leaving my washing up to be done by someone else is much less costly than leaving my lunch at home. <laughs> what about my chili less chili? Well, if I'd put out all and only the ingredients I needed for the dish before I started cooking, then it would have been there in front of me and I would have become aware I hadn't used it before it was too late. So I wouldn't have made that mistake. So what might resilient strategies be for common computing mistakes? Well, one is built into most software, which is to make actions which cannot be reversed, like deleting a file, into a two-stage process. The user is asked to confirm that that's what they really want to do. So while I was procrastinating while preparing this talk, I thought I'd tidy up the desktop on my computer, and I came across this file with all my viable data in it, and I thought I'd rename it. But one's, one's, one's hand can slip in the mouse, and next to in the delete. So it's asking me something. I'm renaming a file. I'm confused. I didn't expect this. What do I want to do? Yes, I want to rename it. And I have lost all my data or at least it has gone to the recycling bin, which allows me to get it back. Um, so these reminders, confirmation things, you know, are excellent so long as we're alert. Um, and we, uh, they fail when we automatically click on yes without thinking, because we are so used to doing that. And there are some situations in which um, that happens, and there are other situations where you think the box is asking about one thing and is actually asking about something else. So um, that's a partial answer, but it can also at times be irritating to have to confirm everything you do. What about my problem with email attachments? Well, a good rule here is that 
you attach the file first before writing the message. You're much more likely to forget the attachment after writing the message than you are to forget to write the message after attaching the file. And it's probably not so bad if you do that. Unfortunately, I find it very hard to follow my own advice on this one. And I think that's because when I'm thinking about sending an email, I'm already thinking about the message I'm going to write. So when I click on the new email button, my mental model of the process doesn't allow me to break off from that to attach the file first. Here's another example where a simple strategy may avert disaster. It's very easy to write an email and then press send before you finalised it. In the excitement of writing best wishes from Tony, um, I sometimes click send before I remember that I intended to go back and tidy up the first paragraph or to spell check it or to check I haven't said anything that might offend somebody in the recipient list. But if I form the habit of writing the email body before I complete the to field, so that it can't physically go to anybody until I'm happy with it, then that gives me a protection against this error and stops the premature release of my message. It also gives me a final opportunity to check the subject line for typos, which is something I do very often because I give it less care than the message body because it's so short. But since that's the first thing the recipient will ever see, mistakes in the subject line create an immediate bad first impression. So next time you make a mistake, it's worth reflecting on whether a slight change in your working practice might reduce the li likelihood of repeating it. So to sum up, I'd like to draw three lessons from the examples we've looked at today. The first is that we are too ready to blame ourselves for user error. As human beings, we are highly sophisticated creatures who have evolved to deal effectively with the complex world. When we make a blunder, there's often a good reason behind it. We would like systems to be designed with our knowledge and understanding of human frailty, systems which protect us from human error. So when these systems fail to do this, it's often a design weakness. User error is usually not the user's fault. From the perspective of many users, those designers were more interested in style and visual attractiveness than in resilience to errors have the wrong priorities. Designing to help users avoid errors is valuable, even if, ultimately, nobody ever gives you credit for it because they don't make errors and they don't realise that's because of the effectiveness of the design. Secondly, our willingness to blame ourselves makes it harder for designers because they don't get feedback about the weaknesses of their systems. Without that feedback, how are they to know that the system isn't as effective as it, as it could be? <coughs> because we are going wrong in ways in which they quite reasonably did not foresee. So thirdly, for these and other reasons, effective interaction design is extremely difficult. It requires one to see the system simultaneously from two very different points of view, that of the machine and that of the human. While knowing exactly how the system is intended to be used, the designer must put themselves in the position of somebody who knows nothing about it. I used to think that writing complex mathematical software for real-time systems was the most demanding aspect of computing. But I now realise that that is nothing compared to enabling complex systems to be used effectively and painlessly. Although computer systems can be frustrating, generally you get excellent results from them, and interaction designers deserve a great deal of credit for that. And one final thought. If a designer creates a system where good results can be obtained only by a small number of users with considerable natural talent who have undergone several years of training and where a large amount of intensive regular practice is necessary if the user is to continue to use the system effectively, would we value this product? Well, that description applies pretty well to a violin. It's certainly not user-friendly. A novice cannot get good results with it straight away. So do we regard Stradivarius as a disastrous failure? 
Well, actually, we revere him, and his creations are worth millions of pounds. So this final example illustrates the complexity of issues in interaction design. It's never that simple. Sometimes ease of use isn't so important. And just before I finish, I'd like to mention a project which aims to develop our understanding of human error and to share the resilient strategies that help us avoid simple mistakes. This is the Error Diary at errordiary.org, where anyone can post about their blunders and can discuss ways to avoid repeating the mistakes. Use the Twitter tag, hash error diary for this, um, and search it if you want to be entertained and instructed by the mistakes other people have made and the thoughts they've put into avoiding them. Right. Well, thank you for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions, but I would also like to hear about any strategies you have for avoiding common mistakes. Thank you. <laughs>